So yes, welcome to 2021, as, well, as far as my preaching goes anyway, I, it's the first week I've preached here this year. I haven't preached it all year, you know those jokes. That's probably the latest I've used that joke now, <laughs> normally it's in the first day. But anyway, that's, 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 yeah. I thought I should include some kind of welcome anyway, since it's my first opportunity this year. Well, maybe you should be welcoming me, that's maybe how it is, because you've been here already. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Eric. Great. I feel much better now, I'm relaxed. Um, but no, is, we can welcome each other. It's uh, not that necessarily 2021 is looking any more promising, comfort-wise, than 2020, despite many of us relishing just seeing the back of 2020. But we need to remember Paul's words to Timothy in 2 Timothy 3 verse 1. So I'll just flick these up. Uh, but understand this. That in the last days there will come times of difficulty. And yes, last days can be a term for the whole era since Jesus' first coming. But it's pretty clear here that Paul is trying to point us to the approaching um, very end of the church age. That's, I think, what he has in mind there. And he goes on to describe not global events like Jesus does in Matthew 24, but the personal characteristics of those living at the time, generally speaking. It says this, for they will be lovers of self, lovers of money, proud, arrogant, abusive, disobedient to their parents, ungrateful, unholy, heartless, unappeasable, slanderous, without self-control, brutal, not loving good. And I'll let you read the rest yourself. So he just goes on and, and I think you can see all these describe, unfortunately, many people today, I think. And, um, and certainly those who perhaps have assumed positions of power. Which is, which is not just the government, by the way, positions of power. I think we've seen that this week, but there is government, of course, some positions of power. But this last week it became very clear that mainstream media, in all its forms, that's not all its forms, that's just a very small part. I don't know if we put the Collie River Valley Bulletin in there as well, but... <laughs> no, that's not, that's not mainstream. <laughs> Minor stream, no. No, they run a whole different thing. But, yeah, how about big tech? I think they're pretty powerful. Big business like you know Amazon and the banks and all them. So big tech, if you aren't aware, so you know Google and t Facebook, Twitter and YouTube and all them. And uh, how about celebrities, sports stars and um, all those kind of people? They they wield enormous influence today. That's where the power often is. And, and big tech that can silence the president of the United States for crying out loud. Gee. It's something we've never seen before. And frankly, together, all these powers have made a total mess of things, wouldn't you say? I hope you agree with me. So, so what's the answer? Well, I'm going to tell you the same answer that I've told you every week, and someone's already said it, yeah. Jesus Christ. Yes. And, and that's not a trite response, of course. I hope for those of you who've been paying attention, it's fast becoming clear that he's the only hope that we have, both in this world and beyond which, of course, is God's main point, I think, in all this that's going on. Uh, sometimes he has to act pretty firmly to help us release our grip on the trappings of this world. I think that's the temptation for all of us. Because we have to keep in mind the truth of Philippians 3, verse 20. What does that say? Anyone remember that? Our citizenship is in heaven. This place is not our home. We're just passing through. And I suspect that when we do get to heaven, we'll be quite amazed and no doubt to some degree embarrassed by how much we're placing our faith in this world and its comforts and structures. So we need to get used to letting go now. So God is doing us a favor as he prepares us for the big transition whenever that happens. That's not the great reset. That's not what we want. But we do welcome the next thing on our journey through the big picture, which is our series at the moment. Um, and we're up to the point where it's the revelation or the unveiling of Jesus Christ, which in general terms can be called the tribulation or the 70th week of Daniel. We've touched a bit on that before. Or the time of Jacob's trouble. That's from Jeremiah there. And so these are all terms we've used previously for this period of time. Not this period of time, that period of time. Now, hang on, Dave. You say, how can, how can you welcome this time? 
if it's called the tribulation, and in some places the great tribulation, so I'll put that there as well, which means it's, it's going to be a horrible time on the planet, why should we welcome it? Well, uh, for those who don't know where I stand, look, I'm a, I believe the rapture is before the tribulation, but um, if, you, if you don't believe the rapture is before the tribulation, you probably shouldn't welcome it. But I, as I argued last time we are in this series, I believe the Bible is clear that God's people, his church, are removed before it comes. So, so that's one thing. But even more and far above the level of just thinking about our own comfort is the fact that this is also, this time, is also what I've titled in these two messages. It's the revelation of Jesus Christ. And we get that title from the start of the Bible book which describes that time. Revelation, obviously. So it begins like this. So the book of Revelation begins with the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show his servants the things that must soon take place. So it's that first phrase there. So yes, Jesus Christ was revealed in his first coming. Clearly he was walking around and when he came as a baby. And then he became a man and he revealed the heart of the Father toward us as he did that, as he lived and died. And that's where he most powerfully showed his love for us when he died on the cross and died in our place. So that's where, yeah, that's where his heart's really seen there in that, that moment. But the book of Revelation is a whole other aspect of Christ, of the Christ. So his first coming was as a lamb to be slaughtered as the ultimate Passover sacrifice. But in the next one, he'll come as a lion to take back his realm from the usurpers. And that's the context in which we find, the, find Jesus in chapters 5 and 6 of Revelation. And we'll talk about that in a little while. But let's put this in the broader context again. Since it's been a while since we've been in this topic and had different things over Christmas and then I was away. So a bit of a recap might help. So God, which includes Jesus, he's God as well, as a member of the Godhead, he created the heavens and the earth. So that's where the circle part is there. And that's not just the universe. The universe is just the bit we can see, right? Yep. He also created the bits we can't see, uh, which are, is called the third heaven in the, as described in the New Testament. That's the part of existence that we were exiled from when we fell. So we fell in Adam and Eve when they disobeyed God and handed control over to Satan. So from that time on, God has been on a rescue mission on our behalf because we sure can't save ourselves, and we've proved that over and over and over, I think. It's not possible for man to reach up high enough to get to God in his own strength. It can only be if God himself comes down to bring us up that we can be rescued. So in order to do that, God chose Abraham. So if we slide forward a couple of thousand years there, through Abraham, that's through whom he built a nation for himself, which is Israel, so that the Messiah would come physically from the lion himself and of the king David. Because he had to become a man to save men. That's the only way it was, can work. And you see, that's why angels, they can't be redeemed like we can. So they've all made their choice once and for all and the blood of Jesus doesn't cover them. But we, as human beings, can still be saved. Which is why it's so important to get the message of the gospel out while we still can. As the sign says there, you know, every follower of Jesus has good news to share. Every one of us. And we have a small window left, I believe, and we need to take it. Even though, yes, many people have characters like that description from Paul in 2 Timothy that we read earlier, and they won't accept it. But our job is not to decide beforehand who's, you know, who's going to accept it and who's not, and who we give the gospel to. That gospel has the power in itself to bring salvation to a person. So we just bring it to everyone, to all. And if someone rejects it, well, say, okay, we, uh, we were disappointed, but we move on and we talk to the next person. So that's, as, as the opportunities God provides, that's what we do. And perhaps they will accept it, the next person. And then we can help them progressively get closer to Jesus as we walk together, studying God's word and, help, and seeking him together. That's how it's supposed to work. And that's how great it is that you know, what Jesus did when he came, it brings eternal life. There's nothing bigger than that. 
And it, the, the gospel also reveals the heart of God to people. And those who are willing will receive it because it's all authentically God in that action and in that story. The whole gospel thing, it's, it's God's heart. You can see it in there. But now, of course, Jesus is back in heaven. He's preparing a place for us. And while he's doing that, he's left us with a job to do, hasn't he? Which is, of course, I've just mentioned it, but I'll talk about it in terms that the Bible uses, you know, about the Great Commission, which was to what? What's the Great Commission? Go to the world. That's taken as expected, but we'll make disciples? Not quite. Remember what I said? Disciple. Not make disciples, but to disciple. That's what the actual word says. Which includes bringing people to Jesus. Of course, that's part of the, the thing. But we mustn't forget the bit where we continue to help them along the way. So discipling them, that's what the word means. Help them understand who God is and, and have a relationship with him that's dynamic and that helps you make decisions as you go because you know God. So that's our job description for this church age. Then the next thing to come is as I argued before, the, the rapture, I believe, where the church is... You don't have to agree with me on that. I'm just saying that's where I stand and I've argued that court case. But that's where the church is all translated. Um, that is, we receive new bodies and are snatched up to heaven, which clears the way for the wrath of God to come to the world, which is the first part of the second coming of Jesus. And as we saw before, also the biblical terms about the coming of Jesus generally refer to that whole process. So, you know, the, all the... Um, coming, the arrival, whatever words it is, it generally applies to the whole process. So the years-long revelation of who he is to the world through the shaking and bringing down of the structures that have so long enslaved mankind. Because remember what the angel told Daniel when he revealed the meaning of Nebuchadnezzar's dream. So I'm referring, for those who haven't been here, I'm referring back to things I've spoken in this series already. So... Um, so in that dream that Nebuchadnezzar had and also in Daniel's two dreams as well he said that that final kingdom would be one characterised by totalitarianism uh, whereas the other three Gentile kingdoms mentioned were named specifically with certain nations this one was far more broad in both scope and in time and will culminate in the final Antichrist kingdom but it will also be a very brittle kingdom as the feet of clay mixed with the um, iron will show, show us. It's brittle. But what's the destiny of that kingdom? Well, if you remember the story, the stone comes and smashes it to powder. And the stone is Jesus. That's right. So yes, Jesus has a final revelation in person of himself, I'm talking about. Um, but leading up to that, there is a shaking of the planet as the judgment of God on a Christ-rejecting world shows us the true passion and seriousness of the Lion of Judah for his own name. He is the rightful Lord of the earth. So this period in history, the tribulation that we look at, is the time he brings that about. Okay, so let's have a look at this. Now, there are a lot of aspects to this, of course, and much is very strange to our ears, as anyone who's read much of the book of Revelation will be able to tell you. It's very difficult to understand, but it's the only book in the Bible that does promise a blessing on the reader. I don't know if you're aware of that, and I'll show you that. It's in verse 3 of chapter 1. John writes this, Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. So, Kylie, you're blessed today because you read aloud from Revelation. So, so there you go. Do you want to be blessed? Read Revelation. Maybe God knew that some people would need to be, need an incentive because you know it's a bit tricky, and anyone honest will tell you that. But really, it's probably because we don't understand our Old Testament as well as we really should, since most of the symbols in the book are drawn from there. So that's that's kind of the key to understanding it, as I understand it. But I, I've got a long way to go myself. So it really is quite a treasure hunt if you want to put the effort in. So that's what I recommend. But anyway. It's not what we have time for in this series to do all that, but what I want to do, um, since I want to do this in a reasonably short time, is, as you may have begun to guess by now, keep our focus on what is the fundamental truth behind all the events of this tribulation period. And that's the fact that all of that stuff, all the scary stuff and horrible events, have the purpose of preparing things for the coming of Jesus Christ. 
So that's why we had Revelation 5 read before. That chapter describes for us how the Apostle John, who wrote down the book of Revelation, when he was called up and allowed to see what was going on in heaven in the, the throne room there, he was devastated because he couldn't see anyone worthy to open the scroll. And since I don't have time to talk all about this very much, just let me say I think it's best for us to see this scroll as something like the title deed to the earth as a generalisation. It does have common characteristics with those kind of ancient documents, the way it's described, so, and it kind of fits there. So um, if we take that, then, then John was kind of sobbing since no one was worthy to take it and open it until the Lamb, that's Jesus, comes along and is found worthy to do it. So he takes the scroll, Jesus does, and he has the seven seals along its side. You can imagine it a bit like that, the old-fashioned, you know how they used to do it. Um, and if he's going to be able to enact what's written in that scroll, which may be something like, you know, what are the standards for the taking charge of earth, then he's going to have to open that scroll. So he begins that process in chapter 6. And those actions in the heavenly realm are reflected in events in the physical realm, as we see as we read through, which we'll look at now. So we'll just do this fairly briefly. So Revelation 6, so I'll actually be talking through Revelation 6 most of this time now. So Revelation 6, verse 1 and 2, verses 1 and 2. This is John saying, Now I watched when the Lamb opened one of the seven seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures say with a voice like thunder, Come. And I looked, and behold, a white horse, and its rider had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he came out conquering and to conquer. Now, as we get into this, I need to say, the conclusions we come to on this stuff we generally have to hold fairly loosely because there are many potentially valid view, view, uh, viewpoints. But we'll try and make the best sense we can of this. But like I said, it's fairly brief. We'll look at it today. Um, now, some do try and say that the guy coming on the horse here must be Jesus because he comes on a horse at the other end of the book of Revelation, on a white horse. But it's hard to accept that because he's the one opening the seals, right, at this time. So I think it's better... And many do argue that it's better to see this as the first stage in the judgment of the earth and revealing of this character known as the Antichrist. Now, while it can be hard to accept for some, we should really view this guy as a tool of God's wrath on the earth. So God's actually using this guy. So and if that's difficult, just think of it in the same way that God used the evil Babylonians to judge Israel and the evil Romans, you know, and... 70 AD, they destroyed the place. And a bunch of other times he's used people who are far from godly to, to judge his people. So, or well, bring judgment at least. So all of them were used by God to achieve his purposes. So I would put this in the same boat as that. So the first action of the tribulation is the revelation of the Antichrist, if that's correct here. So as Paul said in, um, in the 2 Thessalonians 2 passage we, re we read last time, this guy, he makes a deal with Israel, as Daniel 9.27 says, and starts the clock ticking on the last week, the last uh, seven 360-day years of his prophecy. So he has authority and a, and a measure of victory, hence the crown, and he conquers and subdues the world over this time. So oh, and, um, the thing, while he has authority over the world, notice that the command for him to come is actually issued from a lesser being not from God. Do you see that? It's one of the living creatures that has come, which um, one of the living creatures may be something like a cherubim, or a cherub, cherub, a little more correctly, which is a kind of angel. So he's not the big shot that the world will think he is, this guy coming on the horse in the full scheme of things, because it's just an angel saying, yes, give him the permission. So verses 3 to 4. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature say, Come. Then out came another horse, bright red. Its rider was permitted to take peace from the earth so that people could slay one another, and he was given a great sword. So this is the second of the four horsemen of the apocalypse. That's the phrase we often hear. Apocalypse literally means to take away the cover, which is the focus. Remember, it's about revealing Jesus. It's about showing us who he is ultimately. So this rider on the red horse is generally believed to represent war and slaughter as the sword would point us to and just to be clear it won't be that a literal man on a horse will be riding around on earth 
So I hope you can see that this is a spiritual reality. So he's probably some kind of fallen angel like those we encountered earlier on in this series. As are all these writers that come. And I believe, especially when we encounter the ones called Death and Hades at the fourth seal, because they were known Greek gods at the time, the names of them, and um, they're probably part of this ancient fallen angel group. So yes, this is a spiritual reality that we're seeing here. It's, it's what's going on behind the scenes. The physical reality is, as we're reading the effects of these, that these guys have on earth. And, that's, and it's the red horse rider we're focusing on now. So he brings violence within the general population. So that's what the effect of his actions are. So he brings violence and people kill each other as well. And so while the appearance of the Antichrist might for a short time seem like salvation on earth, the first horse, bloodshed will soon follow. So now we get to the third horseman, verses 5 and 6. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a black horse, and its rider had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard what seemed to be a voice in the midst of the four living creatures, saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius, and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. So this judgment seems to be all about commerce and famine. And they're usually connected, aren't they? So, um, and so both would naturally get worse when there's war brought about by the previous seal. Now, a denarius is generally accepted wage for a day's work. And if you read that in the Gospels there, that's usually what they get paid for a day's work in those times. So would you like to work a whole day for a quart, which is roughly a litre of wheat? It's not very much, is it? So let's put it this way. If an average day's wage now is about $200 for the average person, say, how's that for four cups of flour? And maybe even less, because, I mean, that's four cups of wheat. You've got to grind it out and get rid of the husks and all that, and so it's probably even less. So yes, food and probably all resources are so hard to get at this time that inflation goes wild. But it seems from what it says there that supplies of medicine, as symbolised perhaps by the oil and the wine, are still okay at that time. But still things are getting real tough, but we're only just getting started. Verses 7 and 8. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature say, Come. And I looked, and behold, a pale, so literally green, horse, and its rider's name was Death, and Hades followed him. And they were given authority over a fourth of the earth to kill with the sword and with famine and with pestilence and by the wild beasts of the earth. So by this time, things are seriously gone downhill and a quarter of the earth's population is killed. So on today's numbers, that's somewhere north of two billion people. And the threats of, to life are broadened out to many things from the active killing at the hands of the authorities, which I believe the sword represents there, to starvation, to disease, and even animal attacks. So, yeah, these aren't nice times to be alive. So no wonder when Jesus was talking about this with his disciples, he called this the worst time in the history of the planet, because that's exactly what it is. So if you want to avoid this time, you've just got to come under the protection of Jesus today. That's the only way to be worthy to escape all these things, as Jesus puts it in Luke 21:36. But there's more and we, as we read about the fifth seal now, verses 9 to 11. When he opened the fifth seal, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the witness they had borne. They cried out with a loud voice, O sovereign Lord, holy and true, how long before you will avenge, sorry, you will judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then they were each given a white robe and told to rest a little longer until the number of their fellow servants and their brothers should be complete and were to be killed as they themselves had been. So these are martyrs for their faith in Jesus. And of course people challenge those who hold to the pre-trib view and say, if the church was all raptured before the tribulation, how can there be believers still on the earth? And of course the answer to that is that these are people who come to faith after the rapture. And I suspect many will once they realise they've been told all about Jesus before this time and they just realised they never genuinely trusted themselves to him. They either played church or they deceived themselves in some other way. So the term usually applied to these people is tribulation saints. So they're, they're distinct from the 
the completed church body, so they have a different purpose in the end, a um, different role, probably is a better way to put it. But they're still just as loved by God, and when we see how he, he deals with them here in, in this passage, he tells them to rest, which I think is a nice thought, isn't it? It's, he, they've, they've done their tough time on earth, now is their time to rest. Unfortunately, though, there are many more coming to faith in the tribulation who will be killed too. Because the carnage goes on, verses 12 to 14. When he opened the sixth seal, I looked, and there, and behold, there was a great earthquake. And the sun became black as sackcloth, the full moon became like blood. And the stars of the sky fell to the earth as the fig tree shed its winter fruit when shaken by a gale. The sky vanished like a scroll that is being rolled up, and every mountain and island was removed from its place. So basically there's cosmic and planetary upheavals of various kinds. And if people thought that everything before, people at this time there, if they thought everything before was explainable just as unfortunate series of natural disasters, now the divine origin of the judgments becomes obvious. And so those who have the authority on the earth, they suddenly realise they're not quite as powerful as they had been telling themselves to this point. And they, along with everyone else, have nowhere to hide because it's not just the rich people, it's the slave as well, everyone. So they're all in great panic, verses 15 and 17, just to read you that. Then the kings of the earth and the great ones and the generals and the rich and the powerful and everyone, slave and free, hid themselves in the caves among the rocks of the mountains, calling to the mountains and rocks, fall on us and hide us from the face of him who is seated on the throne and from the wrath of the Lamb. For the great day of their wrath has come, and who can stand? So for these people, it's undeniable now. This is the wrath of Jesus, the Lamb of God. And indeed, who can stand? This is a terrible, terrible time. So that's chapter 6. So we'll stop there um, as as far as going verse by verse. Because now I just want to broaden out. And as we head for a close, just touch on some of the other aspects of the tribulation leading up to the final revelation of Jesus. And just a few of the things that we hear associated with this time. Just want to quickly give a overview of those things. And we're going to do that with a bit of a question and answer ses- session, Q&A. Now, it's not me answering your questions from the floor just now, but I've just gathered a few of the common questions about the tribulation. And I'll just give you some uh, quick answers. So let's jump straight to that. So the first one, who or what is the beast? Now, we don't know the identity until that actually happens, but the simple answer is to say he's the Antichrist or the ruler of of the world during the tribulation and, and that's not wrong to say that that's, um, that's true but there's potentially a little more to it because like I said before we have to keep in mind that virtually all the concepts in Revelation are rooted in something in the Old Testament right there's a very Jewish book actually the last chunk of it there and it's, um, it's the idea of a ruling beast is no, no exception so we, we touched on a ruling beast a while ago didn't we uh, in fact you may recall when we did it was uh, in the Daniel section of the series. We looked at chapter 7, where we first encountered the four beasts which correspond to the four Gentile kingdoms of the statue. So even just from that, we can see that the beast can also be a kingdom, not just the ruler of the kingdom. So we need to be careful not to narrow down too much and say that the beast is only ever a single human being. He is that, but the term can also refer to the kingdom over which he rules. So that can be considered the beast in some respects too, so if we're being biblically consistent. So I just wanted to make that point, keep that as a possibility. But also just to clarify that the Antichrist, the the beast personified, also has a few other names in Scripture. And there's a concentration of two main areas I'm going to pick from here. So he's also known as the man of sin or the man of lawlessness, depending on your translation. That's in 2 Thessalonians 2 verse 3. And in the, in the same verse, he's also called the son of destruction. And then a bit further down, just a few verses in verse 8, he's called the lawless one. And then he's also called, not then, but actually further back in Daniel, he's called the little horn. In Daniel 7 verse 8. So that's where a horn, like a beast, has a horn, right? That's the idea. He represents a king, the, the horn on the beast. And he's also called the prince that shall come in Daniel 9.27. And there are, there are heaps more, but they're the main ones. We'll just cover for now. 
So that's a quick overview of the Antichrist. The name Antichrist actually comes from uh, John, Run John, uh, the writings of John later on. It's, uh, that doesn't have that title until then. Okay, next question is, what is the mark of the beast? Now this is an interesting question. What it is, it's basically some kind of physical marker on people's bodies in the tribulation, which they willingly receive, that's the key point, willingly, receive as an indication of their allegiance to the beast and his system. And according to Revelation 13, this is enforced and administered by a second beast, um, elsewhere called the false prophet in other parts of the book, and he's still part of the Antichrist system, of course. So let me just show you uh, from verse 16, speaking of this second beast, John writes, Also it, the second beast, causes all, both small and great, both rich and poor, both slave and free, to be marked on the right hand or on the forehead, so that no one can buy or sell unless he has the mark. That is, the name of the beast or the number of its name. So ev absolutely everyone will be required to take this mark during this period of time. And so the question is flying around today, I'll have to address this, is the COVID vaccine the mark of the beast? That's a valid question because it, se it does seem that some of the newer, certainly some of the newer vaccines coming down the pipeline will potentially have a kind of infrared dye that authorities can scan to find firstly whether you've had a vaccine at all and then it will have the ability to store your vaccine history information on it. And if they can do that, obviously they can store a lot more than just that information on there which is starting to sound a lot like what we just read, right? Now, whether you should take the vaccine or not is your decision, but I um, can tell you that it's not the mark of the beast. Not now, anyway. How can we know that? Well, the mark clearly comes during the tribulation, and as we saw from our message about the rapture, we know we aren't in the tribulation yet because, number one, the departure hasn't occurred, whatever you take that to be, and two, the Antichrist hasn't been revealed and he hasn't brokered the enhanced covenant between Israel and the many, which is the moment the clock starts ticking on Daniel's 70th week. So, no, it's not the mark of the beast at this time. But it's important to understand that anyone who does take the true mark when it arrives will be condemn condemned eternally. That's clear from Revelation 14.11. So if you are in Revelation, you can look over there. Uh, there's a bit more before this in Revelation 14, but I've just chosen this verse. And the smoke of their torment goes up forever and ever. And they have no rest day or night, these worshippers of the beast and its image, and whoever receives the mark of its name. So anyone in the tribulation had better make very certain they don't take the mark if they want to live with God. Because you can't if you have it. Now the next question relates to the issue of the mark. What is the 666 thing about? And for that, let's go back to uh, chapter 13, verse, verse 18. It's still in the context of the mark. It's straight after it. This calls for wisdom. Let the one who has understanding calculate the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man, and his number is 666. In some translations, or some manuscripts, 616. But I think 666 is the most common interpretation. So this is really all we have regarding 666. The only other time the number is mentioned in the Bible, and it's provocative and interesting, but it's um, the annual salary in gold of King Solomon. So it's in 1 Kings 10.14. Now, whether there is some financial connection there, I don't know. I'm, I'm not really willing to speculate, but we can't, so we can't be sure exactly. But other than that, it does relate to the mark of the beast in some way. Um, so we, just, we can't be sure whether it does relate to the mark of the beast, actually. So I think it's fair to assume that for those to whom this applies, yeah, as in when the mark is being rolled out, it will be obvious at the time about what the 666 means. But there is a definite, uh, some, some kind of link there to Solomon, and it has to do with perhaps turning your allegiance away from the true God. There's that, there's that idea as well, which is something Solomon did later in life. But yeah, at the time people will know, we, it's probably not wise to speculate too much about what the 666 exactly is. Just a couple more questions now. Okay, now you might have heard this one. Who are the 144,000? And I know whenever you hear 144 guys like my son, 
think that's 12 times 12 because it's very mathematical. It's 12 times 12, and there's a reason it's 12 times 12, or 12 times 12,000. Um, now, if you've ever had a chat with the Jehovah's Witnesses, they probably don't mention it now, but they used to believe that they had to be part of the 144,000 to be saved, because that's what they thought it meant. But I think they've largely kind of let that one go because there's a lot more than 144,000 JWs. But let's see what John writes about that. Let's see that. So if they're first mentioned, the 144,000 in Revelation 7, verse 4. So I'm jumping around Revelation here, sorry, but just picking these things out. And I've heard, and I heard the number of the seated, sorry, the sealed, if you can read correctly, 144,000 sealed from every tribe of the sons of Israel. And I think a lot of people ignore the fact that they're specifically Jewish. And just in case you doubt that, John spends the next four verses specifying that they are made up of, like I said, 12,000 witnesses from each of the 12 tribes of Israel specifically. So there's really no getting around it unless you're willing to mangle the normal hermeneutical rules that we used to interpret the Bible. But anyway, to answer the question, they are really a select army of Jews who believe in Jesus, sealed by God for the purpose of witnessing of Christ during the tribulation. I think that's what we can gather as we put all the pieces together. And they will witness to the whole world, yes, but if we remember that one of the purposes of this time is to bring Israel specifically to the point where they ask Jesus to return, there can be no doubt that these 144,000 will have a significant role in that too. And speaking of witnesses, the last question relates to those guys called the two witnesses. So who are they? So they are introduced in chapter 11, verses 3 to 12. But um, we'll just pick the key points. God tells John in verse 3 of chapter 11, And I will grant authority to my two witnesses, and, and they will prophesy for 1260 days, clothed in sackcloth. So is that length of time familiar to you if you've been here for a while? 1260 days? It's exactly half of the full tribulation time. And most scholars tend to put that as the first half. And by the way, the context they're introduced into is that of the yet-to-be-built temple in Jerusalem. So that's where we presume they'll do their witnessing. Um, and I think verse 8 confirms that. If you, you can look down to that, I won't show you now. But verse 5 instead says, And if anyone would harm them, fire pours out from their mouth and consumes their foes. So just stand back. Right? <laughs> Don't mess around with them. Verse 6, and they have power to shut the skies that no rain may fall during the days of their prophesying. And they have power over the waters to turn them into blood and to strike the earth with every kind of plague as often as they desire. As if there weren't enough already. So this is why many identify these guys as Moses and Elijah, because they did those kinds of things in the Old Testament. But there's no real way of knowing who they are. So um, again, that'll just at the time you'll see who they are. Hopefully you won't, but yeah. As we know, um, that's, sorry, all we know is that they are God's messengers to Jerusalem. But what the rest of this passage tells us is that they will be eventually killed by the authorities and then three, to, three and a half days later will resurrect and be raptured to heaven. So there you go. I hope that was informative and not too depressing, a bit scary. But yeah, hopefully helpful in understanding what, what is coming and what we can hopefully avoid. Remember that Jesus said we can avoid these things if we are trusting Jesus for our salvation. So we need have no fear. That's, this is the big thing. There's too much fear. <laughs> we need have no fear. And we should be able to encourage each other with that. That There shouldn't be no fear. And what we're all longing for is for Jesus to come and sort out the mess, aren't we? So that's more of what we'll look at next week, God willing, along with being more specific about what the tribulation will achieve in God's plan. So we'll see Jesus return. So that'll be great. So let's look forward to that. Let's pray. Thank you, Lord, for your word to us. I know it's a difficult part of your word to understand, firstly, but also to, to comprehend and take in. Um, Lord, that, that this kind of thing is coming on the world and you've ordained it. So, Lord, we entrust ourselves again to you. We thank you that we don't need to fear because you will look after us. Thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.